The New York Times is certainly the most important newspaper in the United States, and one could argue the most important newspaper in the world. Uh, the New York Times plays an enormous role in shaping the perception of the current world uh, on the part of the politically active, uh, educated classes. Also, the New York Times has a special role, and I believe its editors probably feel that they bear a heavy burden in the sense that the New York Times is, in a, a certain sense, creates history. Uh, that is, history is what appears in the New York Times archives. Uh, if something doesn't appear there, only a, uh, a very uh, committed and uh, uh, a scholar will find it. The place where people will go to find out what happened is the New York Times. Therefore, it's extremely important if history is going to be shaped in an appropriate way, uh, and I'll come back to what I think that means, if history is going to be shaped in an appropriate way, it's important that, on, that certain things appear, certain things not appear, certain questions be asked, other questions be ignored, uh, and that issues be framed in a particular fashion. Now, in whose interests uh, is the history being so shaped? Well, I think that's not very difficult to answer. Uh, in any society, we're going to find that uh, there's a certain uh, distribution of power and privilege uh, in our own society that means primarily the corporate institutions and the state, primarily the state executive, which is closely linked to them. They have a certain conception of how the world ought to be organized and how the domestic society ought to be organized. They own a lot of it and want to own more and want to preserve what they own and want to manage it in their interest. And the, uh, the mainstream media, and in particular a journal with the awesome responsibility of the New York Times, uh, must serve this interest, and I think does so very effectively. There are two major ways, I think, in which it does so. Uh, one is simply by selection. Certain questions are asked, certain questions are not asked, uh, certain topics are ignored, others are raised, uh, and a, much, a good deal of news is simply suppressed, uh, uncomfortable fact, facts that are inconsistent with the way in which uh, those with power want the world to be understood and perceived, such facts will either be suppressed or distorted or ignored. Uh, there's also a more subtle and in many ways more interesting way in which journals such as the Times and others uh, shape and distort uh, the historical scene and create the kind of world that they want people to perceive. Uh, that is by, uh, by, by formulating issues, by formulating questions in such a way that the basic issues are prejudged, uh, that the answers are given before you even turn to the facts. Uh, let me give some examples of both of these dealing with this issue in front of me, which is Tuesday, June 4th, uh, where the two main stories uh, have to do with Nicaragua uh, and with the negotiations, uh, the potential for negotiations in the Middle East. Uh, that's the big story having to do with uh, King Hussein of Jordan's visit to Washington uh, last week, which is supposed to have provided some kind of breakthrough uh, in this topic. Now, let's begin with the Nicaragua story. Uh, one thing that's of interest is the fact that the main story is about Nicaragua. Uh, it's not about another and much more serious war that the United States is engaged in, namely the war against El Salvador, which is what we ought to call it. Uh, the uh, the gov let's compare three, uh, let, let's compare the, the, the way in which the state, uh, the institutions that, that uh, have power and manipulate uh, 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 organized violence, uh, ask how they want the situation to be perceived. Secondly, let's ask about what the facts really are, uh, as we learn from a variety of sources. And third, let's ask how the, this issue is presented in the New York Times, let's say today or for a long time in the past. Well, as the government, as the state wants the situation to be perceived, uh, El Salvador is moving towards uh, democracy and preservation of human rights. Uh, there's an anti-government insurgency which has to be suppressed. Uh, and if it is, uh, progress is uh, hopeful, uh, maybe unlimited. In the real world, uh, things are rather different. In the real world, there's a mass slaughter going on in El Salvador. Uh, if you read the reports of human rights organizations, you will discover that uh, there are indiscriminate uh, uh, air and uh, artillery attacks uh, against uh, defenseless uh, 
villages, which are killing thousands of non-combatants. Uh, you'll learn about murderous ground sweeps uh, which are, uh, in which atrocities are being carried out that uh, compare well with those of the uh, Pol Pot uh, period in Cambodia. Uh, you will learn that torture has increased, uh, is increasing regularly. The Salvadoran Human Rights Committee, in fact, recently described torture as endemic. The Red Cross, about a year ago, uh, stated that in a secret confidential cable that uh, torture had increased to the point where perhaps 90% of people uh, uh, captured, arrested by the police, are subjected to torture during interrogation. Uh, you, in the real world, you will learn that the elections which allegedly carried uh, El Salvador towards democracy were carried out in an atmosphere of terror and despair, of macabre rumor and grisly reality. That's the phrase used by the British Parliament uh, Human Rights Commission in describing uh, uh, the elections that were so lauded here, uh, much as comparable elections in Poland are lauded in Pravda. Uh, that's the real world. It's, uh, in the real world, uh, El Salvador is, 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 a, uh, is a horror chamber uh, where maybe 60,000 people have been murdered in the most grotesque fashion often uh, in the past several years, primarily by forces that we have organized, armed, trained uh, to carry out precisely that task. Uh, it's a country where uh, maybe over a million people are refugees, perhaps a quarter of the population. Uh, and uh, the, the description of, the, uh, uh, of this atmosphere of terror and despair is uh, words are too weak to describe the reality. That's the reality of El Salvador. Now, how uh, comparing, that's of course not the picture that the government wants people to perceive. Uh, how is the press presenting it? Well, it's presenting it pretty much the way it's being presented in this morning's New York Times, that is, with silence. Uh, there is no description in the media of the uh, indiscriminate air attacks which are killing thousands of non-combatants, which are described in grisly de in detail uh, by human rights organizations. Uh, there is no description of the torture of political prisoners, uh, which you can read about in the foreign press uh, or in uh, Amnesty International reports. Uh, there's uh, no, the, the report of the, uh, for example, the report I just quoted of the British Parliamentary Human Rights Commission, as far as I know, was never, uh, was never uh, presented in the American press. Uh, rather, silence. Silence and uh, service uh, and uh, regurgitation of official propaganda. Here is a striking case where the media are behaving very much in the way of a docile, uh, obedient uh, propaganda system in a totalitarian state. Uh, President Duarte, according to the official version, uh, is a, a humane uh, leading Democrat uh, who has, uh, who with a profound commitment to democracy and human rights uh, and is perhaps hampered in his uh, goal of uh, uh, bringing uh, the benefits of uh, uh, bringing uh, these great benefits to the people of El Salvador is hampered by uh, certain, uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the guerrillas and by right-wing elements that he hasn't yet been able to control. That's the official version. In the real world, uh, Duarte uh, entered the government uh, with the, uh, in his words, in his words, he entered the government at a time when he said that the masses were with the guerrillas. Uh, he entered uh, at a time in order to provide a cover for uh, a major massacre uh, which the Carter administration had initiated and was then carrying out. He entered as the, there was a reformist government which fell apart, Duarte then entered uh, to provide a cover for the mass murder that he knew was coming because there's only one way to impose uh, obedience and discipline when the masses are with the guerrillas, namely by mass slaughter. Uh, during the first two years uh, in which he was the person, at least the figurehead in power, uh, something according to the Catholic, the Archbishop, uh, the Office of the Archbishop in those two years, 1980 and 1981, approximately 30,000 people were slaughtered uh, and uh, uh, about 600,000 people became refugees. Uh, the, during that period, I should say, the press, in particular the New York Times, was quite closely following the party line. The party line was that uh, the murders were being carried out by uh, uncontrollable death squads, uh, which the government couldn't somehow manage. 
Uh, the reality was that the murders were being carried out by government forces that were supplied, trained, organized uh, by the United States, uh, that something maybe like 90 or 95 percent of the murders were being carried out by them directly. Uh, interestingly, later on, the New York Times conceded that that had been happening. So, for example, Alan Riding, who's the New York Times correspondent, uh, a Central American New York Times correspondent, uh, conceded, uh, pointed out that uh, in late, uh, this was, it must have been in late 1981, I don't recall the exact date, that in late 1980, he said the Carter administration had been informing the press that about 80 percent of the murders uh, were being carried out by government forces. If you look back at the time, you'll discover that that not, was not what was being reported by the press. What was being reported was uh, that, that the murders were being carried out by uncontrollable right-wing extremists. Fact, uh, they were being carried out by the government forces trained, organized, uh, led, and armed by the United States with Duarte uh, as a cover, serving to, pr to uh, using his uh, prestige as a, uh, an alleged Democrat and human rights activist to help uh, the mass murderers in Washington uh, gain the support that they could use to carry out this uh, slaughter, to send troops, American trained elite units, into villages where they could carve people up with machetes to carry out a bombing of defenseless villages uh, coordinated by uh, American pilots flying from uh, sanctuaries in, uh, uh, in Honduras and Panama and so on. Well, that was uh, the first two years of the massacre uh, since that time. Uh, 1980, it's, it's the figures have perhaps doubled, uh, the slaughter goes on, the indiscriminate air attacks go on. Uh, how does uh, the great Democrat and human rights activist uh, uh, Jose Napoleon Duarte respond to this? Well, uh, recent, uh, throughout this period he has been denying that massacres have taken place. Documented massacres reported by human rights groups with affidavits and uh, observers, he simply denied that they took place. Uh, now. Uh, only a few weeks ago, in fact, he stated that he will not accept any more uh, uh, human rights charges from the Church Human Rights Office to Tela Legal. Uh, he will not accept any more uh, charges from the Church Human Rights Office because he says they're uh, run by subversives, communists, in other words. Uh, he has also denied that there are any indiscriminate attacks against uh, civilians. Again, these attacks are air attacks. Uh, these air attacks, which he denies take place, uh, have been uh, documented in grisly uh, and horrifying detail by uh, uh, human rights organizers. That's the man who we uh, have officially designated to be the leading uh, Democrat and human rights activist. Uh, the press asks no questions about it. Uh, they uh, simply accept it. That's the official line. That's the party line. Therefore, we repeat it. Uh, therefore, we continue to uh, send arms to uh, carry out this uh, slaughter. Uh, it's not an issue in the political system. It's not an issue for public debate. Uh, the only issue that we're allowed to debate is a different one uh, because we stay within the framework established by government propaganda in, a, in an indoctrinated society like this. The question we're allowed to debate is whether Nicaragua is providing arms uh, to the guerrillas uh, to, bring, to, re re to reformulate that question in terms that have to do with the real world the question we're at allowed to debate is whether Nicaragua is providing arms uh, to people who are trying to defend themselves from a gang of terrorist murderers organized by a violent superpower. Well, uh, what's the answer to that question? The government claims that Nicaragua is sending uh, arms to people who are trying to uh, protect themselves from the attacks we've launched against them, from the terrorist armies we've sent against them, and therefore we have a right to attack Nicaragua. The critics say, no, the evidence isn't very convincing. Uh, it doesn't seem as though Nicaragua is sending arms uh, to the guerrillas, so therefore we don't have a right to attack them. Now, in the real world, uh, a different question arises. Uh, first, uh, it would be entirely legitimate for Nicaragua or anyone else uh, to send arms to people who are trying to defend themselves from the depre re depredations of a violent superpower, just as it's legitimate morally uh, one can ask about the tactical issue, but certainly there's no moral objection to sending arms to guerrillas in Afghanistan defending themselves from the Soviet Union, uh, just as there was no moral uh, argument to oppose uh, sen someone sending arms to people in South Vietnam to defend themselves against the American attack in South, in South Vietnam. Uh, the question, it, it's very often governments will not do this, uh, either because they're intimidated uh, or because they happen to be on the side of the murderers,
Uh, but that's a different question entirely. Uh, the question whether they, so, so, so the, the issue is in the first place framed in terms which already beg the question. Uh, they assume the illegitimacy of providing people with aid to, defend, to defend themselves against violent murderous attacks uh, and then the discussion goes on as to whether they're in fact doing it or not. Well, let's turn to the, uh, in fact, in order to really understand this, we have to go back a little bit. Uh, we have to realize what happened in the 1970s uh, and what the Carter administration was up to. What happened in the 1970s is that popular organizations began to develop in El Salvador. Uh, these were often church-based, uh, sometimes Bible study groups, which became peasant cooperatives or unions or whatever. Uh, and that caused great concern in the United States because it appeared that the basis for functioning democracy might be laid. Uh, the Archbishop, Archbishop Romero, in February 1980, pleaded with President Carter not to send arms to El Salvador because he said that the military in El Salvador only serve the interests of the oligarchy. They only know how to destroy and repress. Uh, they will, the arms will be used uh, by the military in order to destroy the popular organizations which are fighting for the people's fundamental human rights. Naturally, Carter disregarded the archbishop's plea because the purpose of American policy was, to dis was precisely to destroy the popular organizations and to make sure that power resided where it always did in the military oligarchy combination. Therefore, he sent the arms uh, and the predicted consequences took place. Uh, uh, a war against the peasants, a destruction of the university, a destruction of the mass media, wiping out of the, uh, political, of the political opposition, uh, and the huge slaughter that I've already described. After all that was done, we could have the staged elections. All of this done under the, uh, uh, under the uh, uh, cover provided by the person who the media, dos in a docile fashion following the state, described as the leading Democrat. Uh, well, turn briefly to Nicaragua. No, it's okay. I was just resting. What? Uh, where are we? Okay, where we are is we're turning to Nicaragua from El Salvador. You were, you were explaining why El Salvador is the real story, what was being, what's being ignored there. Um, well, that's just where we broke off. And that's where, but that's where, where you could have just got Just go on, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's turn to Nicaragua, the secondary story. Uh, here is a long uh, story beginning on the front page with a full page continuation, uh, explaining, uh, uh, discussing U.S. military plans uh, uh, in case it's felt necessary to move against Nicaragua. The report is interesting to read. There is no indication anywhere through this long story that there would be anything wrong with attacking another country. Uh, the only question that arises is, can we get away with it? Uh, will we be, will too many American soldiers be killed? Will it be politically difficult? Uh, what will the costs be? Uh, well, this is the kind of discussion that I imagine would go on in the planning staff of some, uh, some uh, violent state which is planning aggression. Uh, naturally, they'll ask what the uh, costs are, uh, what the chances are of success, and so on and so forth. I presume, for example, that this is the kind of discussion that went on in the German general staff uh, before the attack on, uh, on the Low Countries in France. Uh, it is a little bit surprising, or maybe it isn't surprising, uh, in any way it's interesting, let's say, to see the same story presented uh, with no indication that any further question could arise in a major newspaper. Also, the terminology that's used throughout is rather illuminating. Uh, for example, the, uh, the one question that's raised, one technical question is, uh, suppose the United States invades Nicaragua uh, and suppose that we establish a government uh, which will then pursue the war the way the war is now being pursued in El Salvador by the government that we installed there under the facade of an election. Uh, the question is, who will that government be that we install? And the reporters uh, here say, well, presumably the government will be drawn from what they call the democratic opposition. 
Now, that's a term that they use to describe the forces that will install the democratic opposition. That, of course, is the term of state propaganda. Uh, a, a newspaper that wasn't simply a propaganda organ uh, would at least want to raise the question whether those people are, are entitled to be called the democratic opposition. Uh, what is the evidence of their commitment to democracy? Uh, well, there the, 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 the only evidence that we have is that they refused to take part in the elections uh, that uh, took part last, that took place in Nicaragua last November, uh, and instead chose to uh, join a mercenary army uh, that had been established by the United States and that was attacking Nicaragua from a foreign country. Not a guerrilla army, notice, uh, but a mercenary army organ uh, led by, uh, by officers of the uh, terrorist National Guard that had ruled Nicaragua for years, uh, completely financed by the United States and its allies, uh, based in a foreign country and attacking Nicaragua. That's the origins of this so-called guerrilla force, which inst incidentally, in, in, uh, given the lavish level of its funding and armaments, uh, compares with regular armed forces uh, in uh, Central America and in fact often outguns the army of Nicaragua. So the democratic credentials of the people who the Times refers to as the democratic opposition uh, include refusal to participate in democratic elections uh, and uh, joining a, uh, a, a mercenary army established by the United States. Uh, this army, incidentally, has been involved in major atrocities uh, since the first uh, days. Back, uh, uh, back in 1981 and 1982, Roman Catholic missionaries in Nicaragua were reporting that the Contra Forces, the American Mercenary Army, uh, attacking Nicaragua from Honduras, that this army was uh, carrying out uh, uh, massacres, uh, torture, uh, uh, all sorts of brutality. Uh, again, human rights groups have compiled an extensive record of this. Uh, very little of it appears in the United States. Virtually nothing is reported from, by American reporters in Nicaragua because, again, that's an improper topic. Well, perhaps one could argue that these people are the democratic opposition because the elections in which they refused to take part were not democratic elections. Uh, well, again, there's uh, evidence that one can turn to on that, though one won't find it in the New York Times. For example, there was a delegation that observed the Nicaraguan elections uh, sent by the Latin American Studies Association, the professional Latin American Studies Association in the United States, uh, led by highly respected scholars, by no means pro-Sandinista, incidentally. Uh, they published, the, re the Latin American Studies Association has an official publication in which they report on the elections. That would seem relevant to determining whether this was a democratic election or not. Uh, I don't recall any mention of it in the Times, certainly it didn't enter into their interpretation of what happened. Their conclusion was that these elections were the best ones in the history of Nicaragua, in fact the only ones in, ever in Nicaragua that amounted to anything more than ratification of uh, candidates put forth by the United States. Uh, they uh, re re remarked that the elections were a model of probity, a, a model of excellence by Latin American standards, uh, and in fact not bad by American standards. Uh, they said that the Sandinistas, uh, the group in power, uh, used the advantage of incumbency, uh, but at the level in which it's commonly done not only in Latin America and in the United States. Uh, as for the so-called democratic opposition led by Arturo Cruz, uh, they, uh, the Latin American Studies Association concluded in their study that these, this group was not excluded from the elections as the American propaganda system claims, but rather that they excluded themselves and that they probably excluded themselves because they felt they lacked any meaningful support. Uh, as for Arturo Cruz, the leader of the Democratic opposition who claims that he was excluded, he has since conceded that he was uh, being uh, secretly subsidized, paid by the CIA at that time. Uh, he also speaks of what he calls the damnable atrocities carried out by the Contra forces that he has now joined, uh, and in an earlier uh, article in Foreign Affairs before he had yet joined them, although presumably when he was being funded by the CIA, uh, he said that if these Contra forces won, uh, there would be, um, I think his words were, uh, uh, a massacre of the flower of our youth. Uh, they would create a trail of blood across the country. Well, that's, the de that's what the New York Times refers to as the democratic opposition without, of course, giving any of this background. Uh, now, let's talk about another issue that's not discussed or not raised. Why is the United States so intent on uh, destroying Nicaragua? Uh, 
uh, an undermining and overthrowing the government of Nicaragua. Incidentally, by now there's no, virtually no pretense anymore uh, that the aim is anything other than to overthrow the government of Nicaragua, to make them cry uncle, as the president stated. Why is the United States so intent on this? Well, there's an official answer again. The official answer is because the Sandinista government is totalitarian, because they censor the press, uh, because they uh, treat the church badly, uh, uh, because they don't carry out elections at a level of, de of uh, 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 democracy that we approve of, and so on. Uh, no, but no rational person could regard this with anything but ridicule, total ridicule. Uh, through the entire, the entire history of Nicaragua is one of torment and torture by the United States. Uh, during the period when Nicaragua was being run by a thug who, we, who was installed after decades of American intervention, uh, run by a, a terrorist army that was trained by the United States, uh, which, in, in which the country was robbed blind. Uh, there was nothing even remotely resembling an election. There was misery and starvation and torture. During all that period, uh, there was no concern here, no notable concern here, uh, over democratic elections and uh, uh, censorship of the press. Uh, th that, those concerns suddenly developed uh, in a historically unprecedented fashion when the government came into the hands of another group, a group who, again, let me quote or paraphrase the words of the Latin American Studies Association, a group who were committed to using the meager resources of the country for the benefit of the poor and disadvantaged part of the population. Then, and only then, uh, did the great concern over democracy and, uh, 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 and uh, human rights suddenly arise. In a less indoctrinated society like ours, uh, this sudden conversion uh, would be regarded with the contempt and ridicule that it obviously deserves. Furthermore, even if we accept the harshest criticisms of Nicaragua that have even a minimal level of credibility, uh, it would follow that uh, Nicaragua is a highly praiseworthy country by the standards of the, uh, of the states that we support, the governments that we have installed uh, over decades and decades uh, of our history of torture of Central America and of, that we support now. Uh, for example, by comparison with the government of El Salvador, it's practically a paradise. Uh, the the uh, government of Nicaragua, whatever charges one wants to accept against it, uh, one hears against it, is not carrying out a mass slaughter of its population. It's not carrying out indiscriminate bombings uh, of, undef of, of defenseless villages. It's not sending in elite American-trained battalions uh, to murder and destroy and mutilate and torture. Uh, there is nothing like the mass murder going on in El Salvador. In fact, what happened in Nicaragua is a bit different. What happened is that even though our client Somoza uh, robbed the country blind and left it destitute, in fact, left it with some 50,000 people killed by the terrorist National Guard, which we trained and supported, remember. Uh, a after that, what happened was that the new government did, in fact, begin to divert resources to the poor and disadvantaged parts of the population. Uh, they carried out a successful land reform, the most successful in the region. Uh, health standards went up quite sharply. Uh, infant mortality fell radically. Uh, to the extent that Nicaragua, even under those miserable conditions left by, after over a century of American torture, uh, even uh, it, it, these standard health standards rose so and so rapidly that Nicaragua won a prize from the World Health Organization for the best performance of a third world country. Literacy shot up. The uh, production increased despite the miserable conditions. Uh, these are the reasons for the American attack against Nicaragua. Uh, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. That's when I don't hear about these things. Well, you no, we have church, nobody goes to jail for that's right. attack. How come nobody goes that's right. This is very different from a totalitarian state. In a totalitarian state such as the Soviet Union, uh, if a journalist were to report truths of this kind relative to his own government, uh, he'd, he'd suffer. Uh, he could end up in a concentration camp or in a prison or in exile. Here, that's not the case. Here. Uh, the only, uh, there might be loss of work, let's say, or marginalization or vilification or something of that sort, but certainly not, uh, not, not uh, the kind of terror that a violent state uh, can exercise. Uh, what conclusion do we draw from that? Well, the conclusion we draw from that is that the moral level of the American intellectuals, the educated classes, the media in particular, 
the moral level is far lower than that of their counterparts in a totalitarian state such as the Soviet Union. A journalist in the Soviet Union can at least plead a legitimate fear of state violence uh, when he uh, takes a servile and obedient role with regard to state power. Uh, here, the comparable person can only plead moral cowardice, uh, dishonesty, uh, uh, concern for self-aggrandizement and careerism. Uh, so the moral level is far lower here. Uh, but the, the, uh, let me just say, however, that the, although you can learn the facts that I mentioned in the press, if you really read diligently, what you will not be present read is uh, you will not read the very plausible conclusion that this constellation of facts precisely explains why we are attacking Nicaragua. Notice that the, the, the reasons that are put forth could not conceivably be accepted by any rational person, uh, plainly by the standards of governments that we have installed and continue to support and support enthusiastically. Uh, Nicaragua is uh, uh, hardly count, the Sandinista government hardly uh, counts as a, a repressive or a violent state. Plenty of criticisms one can make of it, but not by the standards of the governments we install and support. Uh, so that, that kind of argument can be put to the side. Uh, the sudden concern for human rights and democracy in Nicaragua, that tells you something, tells you that it's a fraud. Uh, so, we there, so therefore, a rational person will turn to other reasons, and the reasons are those that I mentioned. And similarly, very similar reasons, as a free press would point out, account for uh, the American hostility to Cuba. Uh, if one wants to know why the United States is so intent on uh, destroying the Cuban government, and has been for over 20 years, uh, you can look at things like, for example, the quality of life index that's calculated by the Overseas Development Council every year. Uh, and what you will learn from that is that in terms of uh, literacy, life expectancy, and infant mortality, the three factors that enter into that calculation, uh, Cuba ranks virtually at the level of the United States and considerably higher uh, than any other country in Latin America. Uh, and in fact, even that's misleading because if we take into account the more egalitarian character of Cuba, uh, we find that, that uh, in quality of life index, uh, Cuba in fact ranks higher than urban centers, say higher than Chicago. Uh, now, this is, this is an unbelievable scandal from our point of view. Here we are in the richest, most powerful country in the world. Cuba is a poor, underdeveloped country, and its quality of life index compares with ours, and in some respects is better, considering its more egalitarian character. Uh, that's a scandal for us, but it also explains why we're trying to undermine and destroy them. There are, again, many criticisms that one can make about Cuba. Personally, in fact, I've been involved in protests for years over human rights violations in Cuba. But by comparison with the governments that the United States supports, by comparison, say, with Guatemala or El Salvador or Nicaragua over many years or the Dominican Republic for decades and so on, by comparison with the other countries, uh, Cuba, uh, the, 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 uh, Cuba the, the criticisms of Cuba are, would have to be rather mild, severe enough, but not by comparison of, with the countries we support. The real crime of the Cuban government is precisely that it has diverted resources to the poor and the disadvantaged, that it has uh, increased health standards, that it has brought the mass of the suffering, starving population into some sort of, uh, some sort of form of human existence. Why is that so, in, in, in some ways, a rather good predictor of American policy? If any country turns, begins to devote its resources towards uh, the needs of the poor and disadvantaged, uh, you can predict pretty well what the U.S. reaction is going to be. It's going to be a sudden concern never before manifested for human rights and democracy, uh, and it's going to be the organization of terrorist forces to try to undermine and destroy them, uh, whether it's the terrorist force that we call the Army of El Salvador or the terrorist force that is attacking Nicaragua from Honduran bases, or whether it's, in fact, the terrorist forces who have been attacking Cuba for 20 years from uh, Miami and elsewhere. Uh, that's the cost that any country in our domains has to pay for such misuse of its resources. Now, why should we take that point of view? Well, that's not very hard to explain either. And again, a free press would have this on the front pages. Uh, the United States is a very open society. We can learn a lot about how planning proceeds here. Uh, that's pretty safe because nobody, you know, the educated people, uh, the people involved in the indoctrination system either don't look or don't tell you if they did look for the most part. 
But if you look, what you find out is that American planners all the way back uh, have been quite explicit uh, in their conception of what the Third World is, what Central America is. It is an area uh, which we must be, which must be open to robbery and exploitation by the United States. Uh, it must be a region where we are, it, it mu as George Kennan once said, it's a region which ha which, where we must act to protect what he called our resources, 1950. We must protect our resources in Central America, uh, which means that if any country there begins to steal our resources, namely by using it for their own populations, uh, we've got to make sure that that doesn't proceed. Uh, there's much to say about this, but this is undoubtedly at the core of the enormous U.S. government hostility to Nicaragua today, uh, to Cuba for the past 20 years, uh, and uh, it is also the background, the basis for the, uh, the, the silence and distortion uh, that we find in the press accounts of these issues. Well, let me turn very briefly. Well, the New York Times is very much worth reading because you learn a lot of facts from the New York Times. And if you have uh, a, a rational approach to history, you can even understand something from those facts. Let me mention an incident I was involved in a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago. I was in a forum with a bunch of well-known uh, journalists, and one quite distinguished journalist, formerly an editor of the New York Times, uh, this, this was about Indochina. Uh, I happen to mention in passing, I happen to refer to the bombing of South Vietnam by the United States in 1962. That was when Kennedy launched a war against South Vietnam with extensive bombing and defoliation by the American Air Force. And this journalist, who's very knowledgeable and a very honest journalist, I should say, uh, turned to me in with uh, uh, disbelief and asked where I had gotten that information. And in fact, it had been uh, reported in the New York Times, prominently in the New York Times in 1962. But that's not a fact of history. We don't have the framework of understanding that enables us to incorporate and, under and retain that fact. Therefore, it goes down Orwell's memory hole. Now, if you can, if you do read the New York Times with a level of rationality that uh, is excluded from its commentary, you can learn a lot from the, from the data that appears there. For example, you can learn a lot uh, from this report about uh, U.S. military plans to, uh, uh, to, to overthrow the government of Guatemala. Uh, not the lessons that they want you to learn, but the lessons that a rational person could learn. Uh, that, uh, in fact, the New York Times is a very valuable journal because despite its subordination to state power, the density of information that appears there to a person capable of understanding can be quite valuable, particularly when you supplement it with other sources. Uh, let me make a brief comment about the other major story.